Okay, I know I'm not uh, in okay. person right now there, but I just want to let you know we live very close to USF, so I feel I am at USF, uh, but different campus. So um, it's really lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, today I'm going to talk about harnessing the digital revolution to assess water use dynamics under climate stressors and policy regimes. Uh, this was this work was done by. Uh, my team at Stanford, uh, I just switched uh, positions, um, but a lot of the work was done by my, by my PhD students and postdocs uh, in the past couple of years. Uh, some of you might know water scarcity is one of the 21st century grand challenges. And um, uh, currently the water infrastructure system that we have, which was built mostly during the 20th century, is not really well equipped to address the challenges we are facing. This system is centralized. It brings water from far distances. It actually depends on uh, the assumption of abundance. There's always enough water out there to bring it to us. It's, as I said, it's once true, it bought water comes in, is used, it's, and then it, um, uh, it leaves the system. Think about your homes, for example, while you open the faucet, you use the water and then it disappears. And it also, this system was built based on hydrological stationarity, which means that we assumed um, the hydrology will keep repeating itself and climate keep uh, continuing on to be on the same pattern and would not, the mean and the variance would not change as much. Um, so one of the things that break up that it would be really helpful to have clearer parameters sent from the dean's office because sorry i don't know who is on the call oh, but can you commute yourself please to always be oh students. Okay. okay perfect okay and then the last um um uh, characteristic that signifies the system that we have is it, it depends on steady and perpetual demand growth. We always assume that water demand would grow as population grows and as our economic uh, conditions grow. However, water system is facing many modern challenges. It basically, as you most of you know, climate change is impacting the frequency and severity of extreme events. We have more floods, more droughts. We have extreme droughts. Uh, just in California in the past 10 years, we have gone through two severe droughts which have broken records, uh, historical records. Um, uh, we have urbanization, which basically, uh, according to United Nations, by 2050, uh, about 70% of the population will be living in urban areas. So there's a high density that need, needs water. Um, basically, we have aging infrastructures. Uh, our infrastructure, as I mentioned, most of it was built in the 20th century, and it is not, um, uh, it's sort of reaching the end of its lifetime. And also we have compute, uh, competing environmental needs and, uh, and basically changing regulations because over the time we have learned that uh, we are not the sole user of this system. We have to leave water in the environment because the ecosystem needs water and we have to be mindful of that. Um, so these challenges are basically impacting the efficiency and efficacy of our water infrastructure system. So at these challenges, there are so many new approaches to urban water management. For example, you might have heard that people are talking about diversifying our water supply portfolios, as building recycled water, decentralized water systems, thinking about modernizing our infrastructure and using information technology as part of this process. And also we, um, we have uh, uh, you know, new multi-benefit solutions. For example, there's a lot of conversations around uh, building green infrastructure as a way of uh, dealing with water quality and quantity and also conservation efficiency. And all these things together are basically critical to moving our water sector forward. Um, and, and the main part of this uh, system is basically trying to figure out what is the demand side management as part of this because if we know how demand is changing, if we know how much water people need, then we, will can, we can plan our water supplies more accordingly. So if demand is a foundation of water supply security, um, 
conventionally, it has been assumed, as I said earlier, it's very much correlated with population and economic growth. But um, what we have seen is uh, over the years, this, this fact does not hold. For example, just give you a simple example here. This is a water, pat water use pattern or water demand in one city in the US. Uh, the, the solid line used, uh, shows the actual water use. And the dashed lines are using are showing you the forecast the utility has done over the years to project where the demand patterns are going. And what you see is starting from the 1970s or the almost 1970s, every one of these projections have expected for the water demand to be growing significantly, almost doubling um, over the you know, next few decades. And every one of those have been wrong and inaccurate. And water demand actually since the seventies have been steady or um, dropping um, over time. And um, if these dashed lines, the reason that I, it's this um, slide is important is these dashed lines are what we use to project what kind of, or to plan what kind of infrastructure do we need. And we, if we have been, for this example, this specific city have been building for this projection, just think about the first projection, they might have had a lot of extra capacity or extra water supplies that nobody really needed over time. This was city of Seattle, but this is not, a, this is actually quite common across the US. This is San Diego, the same pattern. You can see uh, the red line is actually water use, actual water use, and the rest of these lines are projections. DC, very similar. The blue line here is, um, um, is water use and all these lines are projections. You can see they all have been off. So as the city of Phoenix, water use had been steady while the projections have been off and predicting water use with girl. Okay, so um, why are we so off? Water use is a very complex and dynamic thing and conventionally assumed to be impacted by climate, economic, and demographics. But what we have seen over time is that there are emerging and understudied drivers that impact water use that needs to be looked into. For example, public awareness, as public become more aware uh, uh, of our water supply challenges, they can actually change their behavior. Uh, urbanization, as homes become dense and less outdoor water use impacts water, uh, overall water consumption. Uh, outdoor irrigation, um, recycled water, as more recycling water become, as recycling become, water become common, water demand changes. So demand is sensitive to a lot of other external forces such as climate, economic, health, think about the pandemic, it's really caused a shock and stressor in the system. Some of the policy shifts, new codes and standards requirements that goes into place, for example, in San Francisco, now we have a requirement that every building larger than 100,000 square foot needs to have on-site reuse system, which means that it's going to impact that building's water use. Or some of the technological advancement, for example, in your home, you have high efficiency washing machines, uh, dishwashers, toilets, they all use less amount of water. So as we make more technological advance, advancement, our water footprint can change. So um, the goal of my team uh, over the past six, seven years have been uh, to, to figure out how we can harness some of the emerging data sources to uncover these new dimension of around water use and in, in a way to inform uh, water supply planning. Um, I'm going to focus on four different studies. One, the first one is going to look at the relationship between drought salience and water use behavior and rebound. The second one is going to focus on uh, some of the online platforms that you're using in our daily lives these days, such as Zillow, Redfin, um, uh, which are data aggregators. Um, the third one is going to focus on uh, measurement technologies, such as um, um, uh, water meters that are used to measure how much water we use. And then the last piece is going to focus on using satellite data to better inform our irrigation patterns. The first two are going to focus on single family residentials. The second two are going to focus on non-residential irrigation sector. And the reason is we we'll almost use 50% of our water outdoors. So it's important to understand how that water is used and how, how those patterns are changing. So for the first one, uh, we wanted to figure out how water use at the customer level is changing and how public awareness can impact that. Um, 
some of you might not remember, but I know we are right now in a drought and we have been for the past two years, but we actually had another very severe drought between 2012 and 2016 in California, record-breaking drought. Uh, our reservoirs were uh, empty, major reservoirs in the state, a Folsom Reservoir and Lake Oroville on the left, you can see. And, um, and we had very limited snow. By 2014, Governor Brown was our governor at the time. He declared drought emergency. And by 2014, he put some outdoor uh, watering restrictions. He actually uh, was a master of working um, media and helping sort of spread the word around the drought. Uh, he actually went up in the mountain, you can see on the top um, right of my screen and started measuring snow. Uh, we do a snow measurements every few months. And what you see is there's no snow, but he's there measuring it uh, to basically highlight the importance of uh, the fact that California has no snow, which means that there has, there's no water for our summer and late spring uh, to meet our late spring and summer demand. And basically also uh, you can see number of media attending this event on this side to basically increase public awareness through media attention. Um, and that worked a lot of coverage of that drought uh, nationally, locally, statewide and internationally. Um, and our question was, was this media coverage really linked to change in water use behavior? And this was driven by the fact that um, I worked with a lot of water agencies and a few of my colleagues came to me and said, we have not changed our, um, our uh, um, water use incentives or conservation incentives, but we see people are using a lot less water. Any chance you guys know what is going on? And our reaction was, it must be media it might be media. So we actually hypothesized this and, um, and we started, we developed a, a web scraping algorithm. There are some pro, uh, propriety tools such as ProQuest and Newsdick and LexisNexis that gather media coverage, but we actually developed our own scraping algorithm, um, which we uh, called Articulate. And basically what it does, it sits on Google search engine and basically search for a number of articles that have been written on a topic um, uh, the, uh, from, every, uh, from various media outlets. Uh, we looked at nine highly circulated national and California newspapers, and a number of them were overlapping. For example, LA Times and uh, is, a, is both part of the national, highly circulated national and California newspapers. What you see here, is um, the, the blue and uh, red are showing, are the basically monthly Palmer drought severity index, which basically um, an index that measures drought severity in, um, in different regions. And blue shows that we are actually experiencing above normal or wet periods. And the red is showing you that we are in a drought. And um, the black line here is what Articulate measured, which was the number of articles that have been written about the drought. And what you can see here is that as the drought severity increased, uh, so as the media coverage. Um, at some point, we got to more than 250 articles uh, within two weeks on California droughts. Another very interesting thing here is these are, there, were, there was a drought between 2007 and 2009. Governor Schwarzenegger at the time did also declare drought emergency. You can see there's a tiny bit of bump here, but not as much. Uh, and part of that was driven by the fact that uh, some of you might recall that was the period of um, we had um, economic downturn and also a historical election in the US and um, drought in California was not really on top of mind for a lot of people. So not lots of media coverage at that period. To test if this is true and if the media was really impacting water use, we uh, got the water use data from Costa Mesa uh, Water District. And uh, what you see here is um, we got their uh, bi-monthly water bills. Uh, basically, um, uh, these are uh, 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 a lot of these uh, water utilities are using uh, old meters that are still uh, that are read um, every two months. Uh, we got data for 16,800 uh, single family and multifamily residential customers, uh, about 2 million da data sets for the period, period of 2002 and 2018. So 17 years, six readings a year for about uh, 17,000 people. And then um, just dealing with a lot of data, 
you can imagine um, uh, there are a lot of errors or issues with the data. We have to match data with, uh, with um, locations and with different um, data sets that we have. So lots of data sort of gets disappeared as you clean it up. And by the time we cleaned up all the data and also found the customers that they're in their residence for the entirety of that 2017 years, we landed about, with about 8,600 customers which roughly gives us, gave us about 1 million data points. And we use change point detection to understand how water use change in these homes. Um, as I said, we use some of the known demand drivers, weather, price, and economics, um, and build a customer level random forest model uh, to understand demand patterns uh, that dependent on these demand drivers. And then, um, and then we took the time period we had from 2013 to 2017 and divided it between, um, sorry, 2012 to 2018, and we divided it to, uh, first divided it to training period and validation. So we built the models during the terrain periods and make sure it's running. And then during the validation period from 2012 to 18, we divided it into four different policy regime segments or timelines. Um, so basically pre-drought from 2013 to 2014, 14 to 15 during the time governor asked everyone to uh, conserve water um, uh, but, uh, up to 10%, we call that voluntary. Then from 2015 to 16, right here, this period, that's when the, government, the drought was really severe at that point, and there was a mandate, first ever mandatory water use restriction put in place. So we call that mandatory period. And then, then, um, and then we looked at post uh, mandatory period when we asked everybody to, basically governor asked everybody to basically declare it, drought is over, and asked all these utilities to think about how they can secure water supplies if we are facing another drought similar to this later. So we have four different policy regimes here. Um, the way we worked with the uh, change point detection is uh, the models that we had for the, the random forest models, um, after we, we ran them for every single um, uh, uh, customer. We found the residuals, and then those residuals basically were not very residuals that were not dependent on known uh, demand drivers, the weather, price, and economics. So in a way, they were showing what else might be impacting water demand during those periods. And then we ran the change point detection to identify when and how people change their behavior to see if we can find some form of connection or correlation between that and, um, and then and, uh, and, uh, 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 different uh, policy regimes and social patterns. And then we did a meta-analysis to understand how collectively customers change their behavior. What you see here is that basically we, what we found was public awareness due to media coverage definitely led to significant water use reduction, especially during voluntary phase, which is when there wasn't a lot of, there wasn't any mandatory water use restriction play in place, and there wasn't a lot of cons uh, um, conservation policies put in place either, like the utilities were not necessarily doing tons of, tons of out, uh, outreach to uh, get people re reduce their water use. Uh, this is showing you basically the higher it is, they are, it's showing the more conservation that happens. So this is the probability of consumption decrease. Um, and, um, and then the, the three groups that you see here, I'm not sure why my mouse is jumping, but hopefully it's gonna stop doing that. Um, the three groups that you see here, this is the uh, single family residential water users but the ones that were in the lower, uh, lower groups, they're not using as much water. Um, the blue is the single family residential high, high user, the ones that are using a lot of water. And then the last one is multi-family residential. What you see here that all three groups re reduce their water use the most during the voluntary period, which is interesting. They did continue having some uh, decline in water use, but most of the reduction was happened during voluntary period. And if we use, if we look at the media coverage, which is shown on the dashed line, the number of articles that we gathered based on articulate, and also Google search indexes to basically see if there is a relationship between articles and public awareness, what you see is, first of all, the Google searches and um, people going online and searching, is the drought over or what should I do uh, with water use or can I, how can I conserve? A lot of different uh, 
uh, keywords that we use for all these searches. Um, and what you see is, first of all, those two are very much related, correlated. And then another piece of this, um, I don't have that slide here, they're basically almost 90%, the, the R square is about 90%. Um, and, um, and what you see here is that the most amount of coverage happened during this period and the most amount of conservation happened during the same period. So they're very much uh, showing connection. Um, when we did the meta-analysis, meaning put, we put all the customers together that were behaving similarly, um, we, uh, we kind of tried to identify trajectory of water use reduction. So what you see here is not the amount of water use, water uh, amount of change that has happened, but the direction of the change. And then we have four, four policy regimes, again here, uh, uh, sort of pre-drought, voluntary period, mandatory period, post-drought. Um, and what you see here is that uh, these are basically showing trajectories. Some people who did not change their water use before, um, that basically they had um, uh, continued on in their patterns during the pre-drought and then during the voluntary period, reduced their water use and then continued on after that. Couple of very interesting things here. Often utilities think the customers, when they use their water, when they reduce their water use during droughts, they all go back to where they were afterwards, which is similar to what you see down here. People change their water use, reduce their water use, and then eventually bounce back to where they were. What we see here is actually something totally different. Majority of people, Actually, 80% of the conservation that uh, happened, first of all, 80% of it happened during the voluntary period. So people responded to public awareness, okay? And then only 30% of those customers that changed their water use and reduced their water use bounced back and went back to using more water, which basically shows that 70% stayed um, at their water use level the very day where they were. Um, so we were very curious to see how real this, these numbers are and if we can learn more about them. So we kind of uh, wanted to see how long water use reductions basically survived once the environmental and water scarcity cues were gone. We went back to Costa Mesa. We got a little bit more data from them to 2020 at this point. And then basically we, um, what you see here is basically density plot and scatter plot a water use, this is only from 2007, uh, 2013 to 2019. And a couple of things here, very interesting. One is that larger water use reduction. So the more people save, the, le the less likely they go, they bounce back. So this is saving, this is rebound. If everybody who saved rebounded, they would, everybody would be sort of around this straight line or basically would be above it if they go back and use even more water after they're rebounded, right? So what? So the majority of people actually fall underneath of this dash line, which shows that a lot of people who saved, they stayed where they were or rebounded just as slightly, not as significantly. So for example, somebody might have changed their water use, uh, basically saved 75% of their water use, but they bounced back only 25%. So we actually use the survival models um, and we, uh, we sort of uh, coupled that with change detection model to better understand rebound. Um, survival models are very interesting. They're very much used in um, healthcare um, uh, industry. Uh, they're used to see, for example, if you do a test of a drug or a, a medicine, how many, how many of the people who respond to that, they survive, how many they don't, or how many of, um, uh, how, how, uh, how effective a, a treatment is. So we used various, we brought that to the water sector, try to try, try to test if we can use the same methodology here. So we used the conservation survival time uh, and we analyzed it with an accelerator failure time model. We use two different rebound models. We said any rebound, for example, if you change your water use and then bounce back just even slightly, we counted that as any rebound. And then we had effective rebound. They're the people who basically changed their water use and went back 
and uh, not only basically rebound it past their conservation. So that's what we call effective rebound, meaning that they, um, they as if they have not are saved any water. Uh, what we found was only about very, actually this confirms what we found in the other study, which is um, only about 25% of the customers had reversed their water savings. What you see here is the basically the survival prob probability. And, um, and what you see is about uh, around this area, which is 70 to 75%, uh, that's when the, the, the probability plateaus, which means that 75, 70 to 75% of the people uh, after five years still kept their water use savings as, if, as they were, and they did not bounce back. And different colors that you see is basically different kind of household, people who only have indoor meters, people who have indoor outdoor meters, multifamily, multifamily and outdoor. Um, another piece of in in interesting information, you remember I said any rebound or effective rebound. And what you see here is in the single family residential, any changes that has happened, majority of it has been, um, some of it has been basically, has taken about 10 years to be bounced back. Um, so a lot of it had stayed on or lingered for a long, long time. Now, um, the, uh, another piece of, uh, uh, another study that we did was we were interested to see how um, residential patterns and evolving air, airborne form can impact water use um, because the, you know we are having we are building all these new developments and it's interesting to know how much water they use. For this specific study, we looked at Redwood City as our um, area of study. About eighty-six thousand residents. It's very close to here. Um, uh, has a very diverse um, socio-economic uh, population and has a lot of new and old developments. So it's a very interesting combination. And we basically created the block group neighborhood clusters to evaluate water use heterogeneity. Um, it's an interesting study because we actually, for this, we collaborated with Zillow. Um, so we got the Redwood City customer water use data from 2008 to 2017, about 18,000 customers. Then we geocoded that and we got the Zillow data. So we tried to match the two data sets. So imagine how complex this can be and how, much, how many data points can fall because uh, the location of the meters and the locations that we had for Zillow data were not always matching and easily can be sort of aggregated. And then on top of that, we use census data to understand basically, so basically for Zillow, we looked at number of bathroom, property values, home values, number of rooms, the, not the, the uh, uh, age of the building. And with uh, simple analytics uh, census data, we looked at education, income, age, and some of the other uh, socioeconomic values. So after all these mergings, we again landed about, uh, to, uh, with about 6,400 accounts and 46 block groups. And then we did some hierarchical clustering on principal components for two scenarios. One is we said, often people use census data to cluster people because income always used as one of the indicators of water use. Um, and then we also combined that with Zillow data, sort of trying to see if having the characteristics of the home would help us with the clustering and improve our clustering uh, mechanism therefore help us to better understand water use patterns. So this is interesting. So when we built the environmental features, uh, when we basically used the built environment features into our clustering, what we found was um, the clustering ended up being much more accurate. Um, so this is the clustering that happened only based on census data. And what you see is all this group with orange, which are high income, they seem to be falling under the same cluster, even though their water use spread quite widely between you know, um, about eight um, CCF to about 20 CCF. So CCF basically is about, every CCF is about 748 gallons. Um, so, um, and then when we actually incorporate the built environment features, what we find is that the clusters become a lot more accurate all of a sudden, uh, you have a, uh, this, this group, which used to be one cluster, gets divided into three different clusters. And um, 
uh, you have a group that is basically high income and high water use. And then you have actually some high income people which have different, um, different uh, uh, housing features that fall under different categories. So uh, just to give you a sense, for example, when we used only census data, this pink area here and the, and the green and the blue here, they all were part of this purple, purple or pink color. And now when we use the, uh, the new clustering with new data, we actually, these were divided into different clusters. And when you sort of zoom in, you can see actually they are quite different despite the fact that socioeconomically, for example, these two, we used to be in the same cluster. Uh, they have, socioeconomically, they represent the same group, but the housing stock looks very, very different. So another very interesting uh, way of looking at this data is uh, we basically, what we did was we um, average custom amount of water use over the years between 2008 and 17, and then looked at all these clusters to see how they're representing. Um, look how interesting this is. For example, the pink one or purple one on top, what you see is the higher income, but the older development. So they're the, the biggest water users. And the higher income, but new development, what happens is they actually use even less water compared to low income and smaller homes. So it just shows you how income is not necessarily a great representation or socioeconomic is not a great representation of water use. Another way of looking at this data is basically we used um, violin plots. They're my favorite because not only do they give you the spread of the data, they kind of give you the probability and distribution of the data as well. So um, what you see is that, but again, average customer monthly water use distributions. And again, for example, the uh, middle income, low in, uh, middle income, high income, um, and um, uh, two, two categories of high income, they all fall under, the, almost have the similar sort of patterns, water use patterns, and um, similar sort of statistical characteristics, even though they are very socioeconomically different. Uh, and then this is high income group that you can see very spread and very different, and it's low income group. Um, so, okay, so this is, this was interesting um, in a sense that it gives you a, a, a sort of a lens into how people use water in their homes. And um, now the question is, how do people use water outdoors? And this is when I'm going to sort of the last piece of this talk that I'm going to talk about outdoor water use. Um, again, this is, we focused on non-residential irrigation sector. We again focused on Redwood City because the interesting thing about Redwood City is they have uh, outdoor meters for resident, uh, non-residential water use. So we could actually um, clearly test the patterns without necessarily um, uh, dealing with the uh, uh, impacts from indoor water use. Why do we care about outdoor water use? You might not know, but the biggest crop we grow in the US is actually lawns, not corn, not lettuce, not uh, uh, potatoes, None of those, it's actually grass. And grass is only out there to make us feel good and look good, but they just basically have no practicality, really. Just in California, if you think about it, we, about 50% of our water is used, is used outdoors. So single family residential or large landscape uh, irrigation. And uh, that large landscape irrigation, just even if we focus on that, as I mentioned, it's about 0.9 million acre feet of water per, per year. And you might say, so what does that even mean? That's amount of water that can provide uh, our water, uh, water to about 2 million households, assuming every household has four people in it, right? So we're talking about providing water to about 8 million people, okay? So that's, that's how much water we use to maintain these outdoor spaces, and uh, you know, commercial buildings, um, you know, HOAs, all those grass that you see outside that sometimes nobody even sits on them, that's where that water goes. That's what we are focusing on here. Again, looking at Redwood City, um, we, they have about 629 large landscape irrigators. And they basically use, interestingly enough, we have 
um, they, they have actually have a simple sort of a test a test bed for us because they had they have large landscapers who use portable water use and they have ones that use recycled water use and also as i said they use commercial industrial and institutional multi-family residentials uh, are included in this they actually have smart meters which is another very very cool feature so we get a lot more data and more frequency uh, so they have daily water use for, from smart meters, about 1.7 million observations. We did some cleaning and aggregation and, um, uh, and basically um, try, uh, and then as I said, we had a simple experiment um, well set up for us. There are people who um, use portable water in the multifamily units, portable water in um, uh, the commercial and resident, the commercial and in, uh, industrial sector, and then we have people who use um, uh, recycled water, again, in uh, multifamily residentials and actually, oops, uh, multifamily residentials and uh, industrial and commercial users. So we had four different categories and uh, natural experiments. Again, we looked at the uh, policy regimes that were, uh, uh, that were uh, set during this period. Why do we care about people who use recycled water versus um, portable water. Because during the recent drought, the 2012-2016 drought in California, portable water users were expected to reduce their water use or stop out their water use. And recycled water users actually were not facing any conservation restrictions because they were basically assumed that they're not dependent on our complex water system and the water that they were using is not going to impact other people's access to water. So they were actually encouraged to use water. Um, so what we found was, which was interesting, is that media awareness we talked about actually reached everyone, while the commercial, industrial, and multifamily residentials who depended on portable water use for their landscape, they reduced their water use so as the recycled water users, even though they were not encouraged to reduce their water use or they were not facing any restrictions, they still reduced their water use. Not as much, but they still did it. And, and that basically is because the, the increase in public awareness, which is interesting. Then we did this conservation hotspot to see how important nor, uh, neighborhood norms are. Are people look, looking at their neighbor who basically let their grass go um, uh, brown and um, follow that behavior or are they, or, or no. And that was what we were trying to test. And remember, these are uh, large landscape water users are uh, the customers that we were looking at. 2004, um, at the beginning of the severity of the drought, you can see, uh, okay, two, two groups, hot spots and cold spots. They're both showing neighborhood norms growing but the ones that have hotspot, they have, their conservation uh, magnitude was bigger or higher than the ones with um, uh, cold spots. But they're still, what you see here, uh, gradually the conservation norms and neighborhood norms are growing and more and more people are joining the, uh, the group. And by the summer of, oops, hold on. Okay, and by summer of 2016, interesting to see is that this whole area regardless of if it's recycled water user or portable water users, they all sort of join in into conservation behavior. So as most of the people who were in this area, which mostly were portable water users. Okay, the last piece of this is the question is, okay, so um, how did the, these conservation rates basically affected vegetation? And I think this is very important because you can see people responding to conservation and not watering their lawns based on the color of their lawns rather than anything else. And we wanted to see how important that is. We used the um, aerial imagery to understand this pattern. So we linked water use with remote sensing data. Uh, we looked at daily customer level water use observation from um, AMI, the uh, advanced metering technology. And then we combined that with aerial imagery from the National Agricultural Imagery Program, NAEP. Uh, the problem with NAEP is the resolution is quite high, 
but the number of the, their uh, uh, temporal resolution is very low. So you get the data every two years. So it's not uh, highly, high, it doesn't have a high temporal resolution, but high spatial resolution. Um, we ended up with 76 parcels in that for this study when we matched the NAEP and the uh, AMI. A um, couple of interesting things. What you see is um, obviously greenness patterns follows um, the, um, the climate conditions. What you see here is the PDSI that we saw earlier too. As you see, as the drought severity increases, um, the greenness reduces. One thing that's interesting about this recent, recent droughts that we are experiencing in California is they are actually um, not only have lower precipitation, but actually have higher temperatures. And these higher temperatures are very, very difficult to deal with because not only they melt the snow faster, they actually impact our vegetation and uh, greenness as well. And so this, this specific drought, as you can see, is um, looking at the monthly temperature anomaly from 30 years, you can see it's significantly um, hotter than any other thing we have experienced over time. Okay, so um, looking at, remember we had customers that used recycled water and customer that used uh, portable water and they were under different restrictions. And so what we did is in this graph, I have um, two, two groups and two different data points I'm showing you. So basically every one of these data points is showing you the average summer weekly water use and how it correlates with greenness, like how green the parcel is. First, we start from the portable water users. From 2010 to 2012, um, they all sort of reduced their water use, but the, because the heat was growing, the greenness, uh, sorry, they did not change the water use that much, but the, because of the heat, the greenness reduced. You see green, greenness actually suffering even more, and then people start watering a little bit more to maintain their greenness, but then eventually um, they're not really maintaining much, and as soon as we go back, so this is the most important part of this, which is as soon as we go back to 2016, remember we are out of the drought by 2016, more precipitation, even though people are watering their outdoor spaces less because they're under strict restrictions on water use, because the temperatures have decreased, uh, you can see the greenness has improved. Now, when you look at the recycled water users, very similar trend. Um, they actually have no restrictions, so they actually can increase their water use to maintain greenness. Even though they increase, their, they can maintain greenness. They reduce their water use, their public awareness, so they reduce their water use, the greenness also drops. And again, as soon as the, the temperatures drop and you get more precipitation, even though they use less water, the greenness comes back. So greenness has a direct correlation with um, with climate uh, and much more than outdoor water use patterns. And that's what we were trying to demonstrate here. Now, all in all said, remember we talked about at the beginning on the top of this talk about the importance of how we plan for water supplies and how we plan for infrastructure and how a lot of that is put on the foundation of demand and how demand is projected, right? So, but however, what I just demonstrated to you here is that demand is quite dynamic and uncertain and actually has not been growing even though our population has been growing and, um, and our economic conditions have been uh, improving. So what we have been advocating or basically our research we hope informs is basically how sustainable and resilient water future needs to reconsider how it does things and think about humans as part of this loop and actually switch to demand side management, thinking about demand as something that we can influence by harnessing unconventional data sources, trying to understand how demand is evolving and eventually inform the water use, uh, water infrastructure planning and decision making for infrastructure investment on this demand side um, uh, change rather than constantly looking for more water to, to, um, to help people, to basically let people use as much water as they want. And with that, I'm just gonna, I wanna thank my students and my team at Stanford and leave you with um, this quote, which is my favorite quote. 
We can solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. We definitely need to get out of this box. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, if anyone has questions online, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A and uh, we will get them answered. I have a uh, question. Thank you for the great talk. Um, this is Diane. Um, the uh, how it seems like a lot of uh, things are uh, fused together to develop this great model. Um, uh, what is the challenges for um, integrating the multi-model data in this case? I can see a lot of challenges that mapping the region uh, or the with the Zillow data or image data, I can see a lot. What would be the greatest challenge would you say? I would say scale and, um, you know, data is collected in various scale, depending on the, you know, the need and, um, and it's sometimes very difficult to combine data sets that have different scale, either temp different temporal scale or special scale. And, um, and sometimes even if you have similar special scale, and um, depending on who's collecting the data and how they're pinning it, it's very difficult to geocode them. As that's why you see as you're sort of combining all these different data sources, we keep losing people in the process uh, because, um, because of those challenges that we are facing. For example, like just to give you a simple mm -hmm. example on that too. For example, Zillow data, you would have said, you would have assumed, okay, you know, they have addresses, right? And this address should match where the meter is, right? But utility use the meter in a different way and address in a different way. For example, just address matching by itself is super challenging. The way people write the name of the street, the way uh, they, everything is recorded, it sometimes makes the whole process very difficult. Thank you, Yusha. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, we have a question to the audience here. Yeah, hi, uh, thank you for the talk. And uh, sure. I think that's a lot of interesting insight about the demand side of the water usage. I think that's great. And I actually have a question on the supply side and stuff because mm -hmm. uh, as we know, like, uh, the water we use at SF, like 80% of them come from like, Yosemite. And mm -hmm. uh, so, and I think uh, one thing you kind of talked about in the beginning of the slides is like, how we can diversify our kind of water supply portfolio. And uh, with like, all those like, interesting like, new technology or technique you've been using, study on the demand side of stuff. Do you see is anything we can do on the supply side of thing? Because I think, because that side is I feel like demand side, you know, it's like a lot of individual. It's harder to actually form some policy and do stuff. But while on the supply side of stuff, I, I would think it's like bigger, it's like easier to make policy and control and working on some infrastructure and those kind of things. I'm just curious um, your take on that kind of stuff. Yeah, sure. I mean, look, I think just to full disclosure, I'm an engineer. So as an engineer, it's much easier to think about things that are, that are much more predictable, which means let's um, build things and not deal with the messiness of the uh, human uh, uncertainty. And that's what sort of we were trying to kind of highlight here that actually we should embrace that part as well. Um, but you know, demand diversification is definitely a path forward for us. And one of the reasons we were trying to do this is actually demonstrate that you might be able to do small changes in the system. For example, promote uh, recycle water systems, smaller size, or for example, on-site reuse systems, or uh, rainwater capture, or stormwater capture. And you still be able to meet the demand because even though they're incremental, at the end, they may add up to a level that can create more security. Um, if we do projection of demand the way we do it right now, the only things that can solve our demand, um, demand problem or actually uh, meet our future demand the way we project it is major projects. Build more dams, uh, raise this, and build more desalination. 
And those things, while sound interesting, they ultimately, they are going to have other problems that we, have, we are going to have challenges to deal with. And I'm happy to go into that if you're interested. But for example, raising dams, um, while you know, sounds, um, sounds like a, as a sound solution, um, if we don't have the uh, climate patterns that is needed for something like that, it can be very difficult to gather more water what we are seeing right now with our climate conditions is it's like these very quick and fast changes between extremes within one year, which means that it doesn't matter how, many more, how much more dams do you have, if you have to release your water to deal with flood and then a month later it's so dry that you have to gather more water to uh, meet supply, it's very hard to manage these major infrastructure in such a back and forth and quick way because they're not built for that. Um, and, um, but you know, there are also, um, there are a lot of efforts around the state on groundwater recharge, which is very important. Uh, so there are so many options that we have on the supply side, but I think the key is to understand how demand is changing in order to inform some of those decisions. Hope this answered your question. Yes. Uh, we have a question online uh, from Michael. Uh, he asks, would the increased accuracy in water usage projections over time be attributed to more data collection or different models and methods being used? Um, let me actually, sorry, uh, Michael, oh, give me one second. Or different. Okay. Um, I would say both. And I would say um, uh, one thing that is important is uh, we have to have better data. We have to actually look at data that's not conventionally used in the water sector. And that's what I was trying to demonstrate here. For example, the media data is not something that's used often or, or some of the other or Zillow data or some of that. Um, so we do need better data, better data collection methods, more, more higher resolution data, but also we need to have better models and methods because for example, economic, econometrics models that have been conventionally used to predict demand has shown to be inaccurate. So we do need new models and methods as well. So both, I would say. Hi, doctor. I have a, thanks for your talk. I have a quick question about uh, kind of the first um, study. Uh, you showed I'm curious how you were able to control for the effects of, and correct me if I'm wrong, between uh, the changes like the policy regime mm -hmm. and um, the increased media coverage around the drought, because it seems like those like kind of co-occur, don't they? Yes, actually, that's an excellent question. I always mention this, I forgot to mention that. Remember during the voluntary measure, voluntary period, there wasn't any policy um, happening, right? So no restrictions have been put in place, no conservation measures have been put in place. It was just basically a recommendation by the state for people to reduce their water use. And actually the original study that we did with media, we actually ended it right on 2015 when the mandatory restriction went in pl place. Um, and we basically that's how we, we controlled for that. Um, but then for the other, the Costa Mesa study, we tried to kind of control for that by uh, dividing it into these different timelines just to demonstrate how uh, these changes are attributed to, partially attributed to media. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, first asks, how do you deal with the challenge of match data, and in particular, uh, has experience with Zillow data not matching any other sources of data he was using? What kinds of methodology you use and what the challenges did you have of matching the data between Zillow and other systems? Yeah, as I, uh, Sean, were you asking me that question, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, sorry, I have a little bit of a hard time hearing you. That's why I, I um, have to thank you a little bit for a second. So um, as I mentioned to Diane, it's, um, it is, the it is challenging to kind of match these data sources because they're collected by different groups for different purposes and they don't necessarily always um, 
uh, sort of code it the same way. Um, so it's it is it takes a long time uh, to figure out. For example, the whole address matching process eliminates a lot of data points just because the way people write addresses can be different. For example, just to give you an example, um, you can say Golden Gate uh, Street, or you can say Golden Gate uh, and not with a street. Like there's people just write these things in so many different ways. Um, and just some people abbreviate things, some people don't abbreviate things. So it's just like, depending on how these data information was put in, it makes it very, very difficult sometimes to match them. So the challenge is always, um, uh, is just this data collect, uh, combining, or aggregating different data sources is just like uh, matching the temporal and spatial resolution and also dealing with uh, discrepancy between the way the data is collected. We have another question. Um, was this study uh, California centric? And if so, uh, what kinds of possible applications do you see to it be used in other regions? And what types of challenges do you see in migrating these regions? That's a great question. Okay, actually, this is we did we um, uh, we did this in California. Uh, just because we wanted it to have a platform to demonstrate some of these methods and um, approaches. Um, right after we were about done, um, uh, you might recall that day zero was happening in Cape Town. And uh, so a colleague of mine um, in Cape Town started using some of the same methodology to demonstrate how uh, day zero was pushed back in uh, in Cape Town by using, uh, uh, by using it as a sort of media outreach. And, um, and they tested it and it was working. And this had actually become a, a sort of like a reference is this specific study has become a reference for a lot of people who are testing these uh, uh, public awareness and media impacts in various topics, actually, not just water use uh, to see how, for example, for climate change, for, um, energy use and a lot of other things. So it is definitely picking up. People are realizing the importance of this um, as a factor. Okay. Um, did you get a sense of what type of behavioral changes were most impactful in uh, the reduction in water use? I know you focused a lot on landscape water use, but were there any types of behavior which would lead to greater water use and more long-term reduction in water use? Sure. Um, um, you know, we, we looked at both indoors and outdoors, but those two examples of outdoors were the ones that I wanted to highlight. But one thing actually what that you saw in the, for example, the housing stock that I was showing, the um, urban form, is that you see um, high, high efficiency um, homes have uh, used less water, um, you can see some of the things that people rebound from are the behavioral changes. For example, people during the drought start gathering water from the shower and using it in their toilet or outdoors. People do um, use less water, are much more mindful of how they use their water. So these are behavioral changes and most of those actually bounce back after the drought is over. The structural changes are much more uh, resilient and last longer. For example, those are the ones that people go replace their toilets and replace their washing machine, dishwasher, uh, uh, improve their fixtures, replace, uh, fix their leaks, um, uh, which is actually a very important part of this whole thing. So there are so many, uh, or, or actually use for information technology. There are these apps that people use to understand how they're how much water they're using in different time of the day, uh, for what purpose. Those are the ones that basically make some structural changes in water use and that actually um, impacts um, water use more permanently. Um, your study focused mostly on kind of residential. You also had some commercial data in there. Were you looking at uh, data from farming use as well, or was that not included in the study? Um, no, we did not look at farming or uh, basically, basically agricultural use in this specific study. Uh, however, the media study, um, just to talking about the reach of that work, um, uh, is being used by a group up in uh, Canada, looking at how farmers are responding to 
uh, media uh, coverage and public outreach as a way of uh, becoming more efficient. And they have found that it has an impact in the way farmers use water as well. But we did not do that study, we, but the study we have done is being used as a, um, as a, a, a tool for, for the study that's being done up there. Great, well, thank you so much. Um, of course. We're about out of time. Uh, my pleasure and um let me know if you have any questions feel free to reach out to me um and um i'll be happy to answer any questions you may have later as well thank you Nusha, so much. Uh, i want to thank everyone for attending uh, online or in person i look forward to seeing you in the future nice to meet you bye thank you <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. But it looks it looks